Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning to those of you in the West Coast. Welcome to our program today entitled, A Breach Can Happen to You or Already Has and You Just Don't Know It Yet, How Nonprofits Can Best Manage Cybersecurity Risk. My name is Jeff Tenenbaum, Chair of the Nonprofit Organizations Practice here at the Venable Law Firm. And this is our monthly program devoted uh, to a wide variety of nonprofit legal topics that we have been doing for the last five years or so. Uh, obviously, our last program of the 2015 year, um, and uh, we're glad you could join us. We have a nice crowd here in D.C. and about 250 folks registered for our webinar across the country today. Um, today's topic is one that is of critical importance uh, to every nonprofit organization. It's a topic that you hear and read about in the news and in the media uh, um, on virtually a weekly, if not more frequent, basis. Um, and it's an area that every nonprofit really has to understand, has to learn uh, pitfalls, risks, best practices, and you're going to learn a lot of that here today from our three terrific speakers who I will, I will introduce shortly. A few housekeeping tips uh, uh, matters first. First, for those of you in the Trade and Professional Association community, this program is eligible for continuing uh, education credit uh, for the CAE, Certified Association Executive Program preview of our upcoming programs. We have three scheduled so far in 2016. On January 14th, uh, our program is entitled Impact Investing in Nonprofits, Opportunities, Innovative Structures, and Creative New Ways to Raise Funds and Further Your Mission. This is a program that's being co-sponsored with Inside NGO, and based on the fact that we have had more people sign up for this program quicker than any program we've ever done. We already have, I think, 300 folks registered for the program, and that happened within a few days of sending out the invitation. I have no doubt it's going to be a terrific program. It's a very, very popular hot topic, and I encourage you to, to attend or, or sign up online. Uh, February 4th, our topic is entitled Nonprofit Chapters and Affiliates, Finding Structures and Relationships that Address Your Challenges and Work Well for Everyone. And then on March 10th, our program is entitled Nonprofit Federal Award Recipients Meeting New Requirements, Avoiding Dangerous Pitfalls, and Adding Value Through a Strong Compliance Program. Uh, uh, about once a year, we try to devote uh, one of our monthly programs to uh, uh, federal grant and contract issues for nonprofits. We're also, uh, Inside NGO is also co-sponsoring this program with us. We have some really terrific speakers for that uh, program, and I'm looking forward to that in March. Uh, handouts. Those of you in the room here have a printed handout book that has all of the PowerPoint slides along with some ancillary uh, resources, some articles, uh, and full uh, biographies of our speakers. Uh, those of you on the webinar and uh, the confirmation email that you received, I think this morning, uh, it has a link to the PowerPoint slides. All of you tomorrow will receive an email that has a link to the recording of today's program, uh, along with all of the handout materials. Um, and there are also some additional uh, resources that uh, Eric's going to be referring to that uh, will have those included uh, linked to that email as well. Feel free to forward that on to uh, colleagues or others who would benefit from that. All of these programs are recorded. And we post them on our nonprofit YouTube channel, the link to which is on the last slide of today's PowerPoint presentation. Uh, in terms of questions, those of you in the room, we're going to take questions throughout the program. If you have a question, raise your hand. I'll call on you and just do me a favor and wait for the microphone to get to you so those on the webinar can hear your questions. And those on the webinar, pose your questions to me using the chat feature of, um, of the uh, webinar software. Now, our speakers. We had we had two speakers lined up. If you remember the original invitation that went out, we had two of my colleagues, uh, Bobby Turnage and Eric Jones, who I'll introduce here in a minute. Um, but then, what was it, Dan? Last week, Dan and I were out getting some drinks, and, and I said to him, uh, you know, we're doing this program uh, next week on uh, privacy and data security, which is the area that Dan specializes at in AARP. And I said, we'd love to have kind of a practical in-house perspective on this, uh, which I thought would be a nice kind of rounding out, and Eric and Bobby readily agreed. But Dan said, I'll only do it if I can give the whole presentation in a deep southern drawl. So I'm really looking forward to hearing Dan's remarks here today. And Bobby, no offense. But. <laughs> All right, Bobby Turnage, to my immediate right, uh, is uh, my colleague and a partner in Venable's uh, corporate practice. Uh, Bobby has um, an in-depth understanding of the inner workings of successful business operations. Prior to joining Venable, he served as Senior Vice President and General Counsel for Network Solutions, a leading web presence and serv presence services company. Uh, he also, prior to that, worked as a litigation associate in private practice and served as Associate General Counsel for VeriSign. 
and also served as a defense attorney and prosecutor in the U.S. Army Reserve JAG Corps. To Bobby's right is my colleague and partner, Eric Jones. Uh, Eric is a partner who helps lead the firm's congressional investigations practice and works with the state attorney general uh, practice as well as our e-commerce privacy and data security practice. He has, he has significant investigatory and policy experience in state and local government as well as in the private sector. Prior to joining Venable, uh, Eric served as assistant attorney general and director of the policy bureau for the Illinois Attorney General's Office. Um, and prior to that, was deputy general counsel and chief investigative counsel to the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce under Senator Jay Rockefeller, um, where he did extensive work on uh, cybersecurity matters, uh, part of which is very relevant to today's program. And finally, uh, our late addition to the panel, but certainly uh, a very, very welcome addition, uh, Dan Kozlowski, uh, Chief Privacy and Compliance Officer at AARP. Uh, we have the, uh, the benefit of uh, being able to work closely with Dan uh, and his colleagues at AARP. Uh, he, he currently serves as Chief Privacy and Compliance Officer, where he's responsible for ensuring compliance with an array of federal, state, and local industry regulations governing data, privacy and security, telemarketing, email marketing, and, the, and all of, um, and many more areas. He previously served in several legal services positions, including, including Director of the Senior Citizen Law Project at the New Hampshire Legal Assistance uh, and Senior Staff Attorney in the Consumer Fraud and Financial Abuse Unit at the Legal Counsel for the Elderly. Uh, Dan is going to be offering color commentary and practical kind of in-house uh, perspectives uh, to the remarks of Bobby and Eric today. And without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Eric to get us started. I mean, sorry to Bobby to get it. That's all right. That's all right. We'll, uh, we're flexible. We'll, um, we're going to, as, as Jeff mentioned, we're going to, thanks, we're going to uh, kind of switch off and, and run through different things in the presentation here. But wanted to start off by showing you, of course, a little bit of on the agenda what we're planning to cover. Um, we will hit a couple of these initial points just to make sure we're all on the same page. What I have found is usually very helpful is if, as we move into the topic of cybersecurity uh, data protection that we are all thinking about it uh, in the same way. Sometimes what we think of as the data that's at risk might be more limited than in reality it is when we think about who the bad guys are uh, and how they do what they do. Uh, we, we each may have our own experiences or things that we've read. We just want to make sure we're all seeing kind of the really the breadth of each of these uh, uh, particular uh, topics. So we'll jump into this. Uh, we're going to switch off slides. Uh, we're not going to go every other one, so we're going to try to keep it uh, a little more interesting than that for you. Um, but we'd ask you to jump in and ask questions as you have them. It's fine. We're going to hopefully have time at the end to do that as well, but you're not going to, to bother us. In fact, we encourage it while we're going along, and let's have some, uh, some dialogue about this. So you see the agenda there. First thing we're going to talk about is what do the bad guys want, and uh, just – uh, work with us as we give you the scope of, of, of what we're dealing with in cybersecurity, and then we're going to really jump into some things that are practical uh, tips on things you can do, things you should keep in mind as you consider your own uh, risk uh, related to cybersecurity. So, Eric, with that, let's, uh, let's jump into it. Okay, so we're going to start off with um, a little bit of information about what the bad guys want. Now, it, we're not going to spend too much time on this because it's going to be useful to, to really go into what you and your organizations can be doing to both um, prevent data breaches and then and mitigate the harm that could be associated with the data breach in the event that it happens. And, and before we get into it, I think it's worth just explaining why we're in the position that we're in. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I do think it helps color everything else that we're going to be saying. Um, you know, in the last 20, 30 years, uh, the United States has taken basically everything we have done as a society, and this is increasing every day, and turned it into data. And doing that has created great uh, innovation and efficiencies in our economy and has been a tremendous thing for our country, but it has also left, left us uh, increasingly vulnerable because the Internet was created to share information, not to protect information. And so what we're trying to do is you have a system that is set up for sharing, and then on top of that you're trying to put security. And so securing data um, is one of the great challenges of our time, and it has been something I've been working on in government, and I left government to help work with companies and organizations deal with it on the private sector side. 
And the good news is, as, as, as bad as some of this what we're going to share is, the good news is there, advances are being made, and there are things that you can do to help um, have an impact on preventing the likelihood of something happening. But so first, let me get into what, what is it that the bad guys want? Well, what you're seeing, what, what, when you think of a data breach, you probably think of the most current, common data breaches that occur, which are the nationwide breaches that everybody hears about, which are related to uh, either credit card numbers or social security numbers. And if you're an organization that holds that, that kind of information, that means you are a target of the bad guys because they can make money off of selling that information um, on the, the black market. Now, at the same time, I don't want anyone, and this is why we wanted to go through this slide, just because you don't have, let's say, credit card info of, a, of an individual or a social security number, that does not mean that you will not end up being a target. And uh, here's why. One example is there are commonly uh, breaches related to email addresses. And even though this, this may not seem the case, an email address with a person's a name attached to it is worth money on the black market. You can make money uh, through either fraud or spam. And so that is a target. Um, Employee data is a target. Um, the recent breach that happened with Sony is a, a great example of that. Um, that it also goes to, I'm bouncing around a little bit, but that also goes to the last point, which was related, related to disruption and destruction. Um, there are a n host of reasons why a breach can happen. And so um, it can be related to also the trade secrets that a company has um, or an organization has. And we shouldn't assume that if you're not a large company um, that holds 15 million or 100 million um, credit card entries that you're not a target. And so that's the main takeaway I want to I provide everybody with this slide. Um, when I was working for the Illinois Attorney General's office, um, we tracked all the, the breaches that were occurring in the state, and then we also worked with other states to sort of get a feel for what was happening. And California actually has a nice law um, that's useful for, for their office that requires any breach to occur, that it occurs for the um, entity that was affected to report to the, the uh, office. And I can include this in what we send around, a link to this website so you can take a look at it yourself. But what you see in that list of breaches, and there are thousands of them, most breaches are not the Home Depot breach or the Sony breach. Most breaches are happening to small and medium-sized companies and organizations. And so just because you are not the largest organization in the country or one of them does not mean you not, are not a target. And I think that's, that's something that's the main takeaway I want to have from this slide um, is that you, you, think about everything that you have and a lot of that information could be valuable even if it's not a credit card or a uh, social security number. And then secondly, um, that you don't have to be a large organization to be impacted. And then finally, the last point, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, is in the last couple of years, we've seen a, a move, uh, hackers move from just targeting credit cards and social security numbers to targeting other things as well. Sony's an example. The Ashley Madison breach is an example. And I know that is not the sort of information that you will hold, but it, it does show that there is a movement away from just targeting financial data. Um, the recent breach of VTech, which is a company that holds uh, information related to children, um, was just announced. And so I just think it's important to keep all those in mind. You know, Eric, also um, just to point out that sub bullet that says includes third party information. <clears throat> I know you see it there, but as, as you think through that, sometimes we think about just what we have that's related to our organization and how we operate and maybe the members uh, or customers, however you, you, um, you look at those uh, whose information you collect. But also think about that third-party information. It's not unusual for organizations to have agreements with other organizations where there's a confidentiality arrangement um, and you're sharing information. Um, there could also be, uh, depending on the nature of your operation, you could be, you could be housing that data for any, any number of reasons. But just remember to think as broadly as possible when we're talking about what is it that I have that the bad guys want, because that will help you as we, as we go further through this and as you think about steps you can take uh, to protect, as well as the potential exposure for your uh, organization uh, if that information is uh, breached. I also wanted to 
point out a, an article that's in your handout materials that we just uh, I think put out yesterday uh, about a new IRS proposal um, that would give charities uh, the option of instead of providing written substantiation to donors for contributions of $250 or more would enable them to do uh, what's called donee reporting directly to the IRS uh, of those contributions. But to do so, they would need to collect uh, among other information, social security numbers of donors, um, something that has gotten a lot of people's attention. There's a number of folks who are very opposed to it, and part of the opposition comes from uh, from concerns on the on the data security side. Yep, great points, Jeff. All right, our next slide. I can do this right. Did I? All right. So we've talked a little bit about at a high level what do the bad guys want. So now let's talk about who are the bad guys? Who are we talking about? Who falls within that category? And we're going to give you some high-level kind of categories to think about, and then um, you know, there may be variations on these themes. But at a high level, the way to think about it is, is this. You see there, nation-state uh, sponsored. You'll hear references to advanced persistent threats, very sophisticated uh, attacks. These are well-funded uh, efforts uh, by a nation-state, so by a government that is uh, trying to, for, for some reason, for gathering intelligence to be used for economic advantage, could be military purposes or political advantage. Um, you also have organized crime. There are groups that want to get that information, could be credit card, could be uh, health information, that's pretty uh, ex uh, valuable information on the black market. Uh, and they're, they're usually principally financially motivated. The hacktivists, we list them because they are a reality. And these are people that really aren't necessarily trying to get the data because they intend to sell it and try to make money. They're really doing it more to get attention. It could be because they have a particular cause. So you're against a particular cause and you've got a group of bad guys. You can all go in and bring down the website or, or take over the website and post your own message so that visitors to uh, the particular organization uh, that, that you have an issue with uh, will see your message instead of the intended message. Um, same thing there with uh, employees and customers. Thinking about, it's not just these uh, hacktivists who sit out there and, and specialize in this. It could be people within your own organization, either who are currently there or who used to be there, and they're upset with you for some reason. How, you, how you've handled them is, is a typical one uh, that comes up. And it's, um, and it's also true with uh, customers or other businesses uh, or organizations with whom you do business. Um, they may have issues with you and how you have interacted with them, and so they can uh, then turn on you. Um, so think about those categories and see just how broad that is, the landscape. We've talked about what is it that they want, who are these people that want this stuff. You can see it's starting to, to really expand. All right, Eric, you're up. Okay, so now let's walk through, because this is going to be relevant to our, the piece we, that's the most important part of the talk about how to mitigate and how to prevent data breaches. It's understanding how the, these bad actors are going about um, accessing your uh, systems. Um, first off, they're going to take advantage of any vulnerability they can in your system. Um, and it, examples of this are, from time to time, a producer of software, for example, will realize that there is some sort of vulnerability in that software, and they will have to send out a security patch so that you have to uh, update your system. And is anybody familiar with this? When you, you try to log into your Apple or Windows, it'll say, there's a security update. Would you like to update? And sometimes we press no because we need to get onto the computer. Well, what you're doing by there, by, by pressing no instead of yes, you're allowing a, a – by the way, these companies are not going to just take the time to provide you with a, a security patch because they feel like it. It's because they realize something's wrong and they need to fix it. And so, but when we do that, and a lot of people do it, it happens all the time, um, you are maintaining a, a vulnerability that somebody is likely to exploit. And so uh, when, when I was working in the AG's office, when we saw these, some of these big breaches that were occurring, um, frequently it would be related to somebody um, taking the time and, and, as it says in the slide, being very patient and probing, figuring out which company had not um, updated a security patch and exploiting that vulnerability. Um, and once they get into your system, into a system, I don't want to say it's on anyone in this room, but um, once they get into a system, it, it can allow them to move laterally throughout it. So they might be able to access 
something that's not that important, but if the, if the security settings are not tight and such that they're prevented from moving, they will get access to something that maybe your, a company or an entity is not really that concerned about, but once they're in, they figure out a way to move about. And um, a lot of the breaches occur that way. Eric, could I jump in there sure. real quickly? The, just, I can think of experiences where um, the forensic experts that we've brought in to, to look at a particular breach scenario um, are able to see that it, it sometimes, when we say patient and probing, it could be months and months and months and months. Um, these folks are, they, they really are the really good bad guys are very, um, they are very patient and they also know how to do things in a way that helps disguise the activity. So they're not in this huge rush to try to grab, in uh, the particular uh, type that I'm talking about, they're not in a huge rush to try to grab everything they can and get out. It's let me get in, let me see where I can get in. And it may not be the initial point of, of attempted access may not be where you have the crown jewels. It may just be simple, uh, a simple uh, access point but that allows them to then kind of look around in there, see, what's, see what, what can I gain while I'm in here? What can I learn? I'll take that and add it to my little database of information I'm collecting. Now let me go look somewhere else. Very patient, moving around, collecting information, and then ultimately finding ways to, to get into the more uh, in, interesting information that, that may be in your database. Thanks, that's really, really helpful. That's a very good point. Uh, another point of access that occurs for organizations is uh, through third-party vendors. And third-party vendors are all the different entities that are, are helping us do our business, and because of that, or, or helping us run our organization, and because of that, you have to give them some kind of access. And so the issues that I'm, I was discussing as it relates to vulnerabilities and systems can also Anything that can, can be exploited to get in directly to your organization's system um, could also be used to get in through a third-party vendor. And so it's very important to understand that any, any third-party vendor that has access to your system is a, a possible entry point, and some of the large data breaches that have occurred in this country are through those third-party vendors and that access. Because what you're doing by allowing a third party to have access to your system, you are allowing a external, somebody who is using the, the internet to gain external access to a system. And by doing that, you are opening a system up to, to, to possibly being exploited. And while it's important that, and you have to allow third-party vendors to have access, it's important to think about what does that access look like? Is, are we limiting it in the way that, that we should be? Um, are they having to go through the proper controls in order to gain access? Is it a, a level high enough? Um, and so any organization or nonprofit that's thinking about how to protect their security or increase their security needs to think about what kind of access the third-party vendors have because that's often exploited. Uh, another issue are uh, rogue employees that have inside access. That is always an issue because there are people within your organization that have access to, uh, especially those who are um, either high level or operating within the IT environment, they have access to a lot. And so it's important to be thinking about what, uh, what individuals can gain access to. Does, does somebody have, as an administrator password, have access to the entire system? Or are you thinking about how to, imp to limit that access? And then uh, another, uh, this is probably the most important point I would, I would make on this slide, are that well-meaning employees can be the um, vulnerability that is um, exploited. Um, it, it's, it, it's well known that the weakest part of any sort of security chain is us, the humans using the system. We are more often than not the reason a breach occurs in some fashion, whether it's because somebody is failing to click, if, if it's on them to click on sort of that update, the patch that I was speaking of, or if they're clicking on a link that um, they shouldn't be clicking on, which allows access of some kind. And the hackers that are trying to um, get into the system, they know that, and so that's, they're trying to exploit your employees if they're trying to access your system. There are examples of um, social engineering where they will uh, figure out who somebody might work with in order to um, impersonate an employee to send an email to trick them into providing information that they wouldn't otherwise um, provide. There, are, there is um, phishing where they're trying to get them to click on something that can lead to uh, some kind of malware which would, would cause something to be uploaded onto the system. Um, and something I, I like sharing when I give these talks is um, 
it, it's, it's often, you know, it's up to the individual to create their password to log into a system. Does anybody know what the most popular password was for last year? Anybody want to take a guess? Password. password. No, that's not it anymore. People are getting smarter. It's now one, two, three, four, five. So, and if anyone out there, if you're, if you're thinking, oh, that's my password, <laughs> if you get anything out of today, change that password. If we need to take a five-minute break yeah, and right. run and, out. And, and, and don't change it to your, to your, to your dog's name either. Um, I don't know if anyone has seen this, and I, don't, I, I know, we, we have a lot, you know we have a lot that we want to get through, but I want to share one quick tidbit. Just because you, the only kind of password that works is a password that is meaningless, that has, it's not a name that's in a dictionary, and it's alphanumeric where it means you have random letters and numbers that are all together that only you know. Because uh, a vulner something that that, comp that um, uh, these these hackers take advantage of, there are computing systems that allow you. It's called a brute force attack. If your system allows somebody to try to log in over and over again, you can literally try millions of passwords in the blink of an eye um, with great computing power. And so. Even if it's a, you know, you have it as a sort of maybe your address or the name of your, you know, your grade school, that th those can be hacked too. And so that's just something I always like to share because it's some, it's a simple thing that can be done that actually can have an impact. Uh, and the final um, sort of impact that just it's worth thinking about and and um, knowing about are what are called uh, DDO, DDoS attacks, which are denial of service attacks, which is when a, a hacker sends so much traffic using compromised computers to a website that completely shuts it down. And so um, those kinds of attacks can literally cripple a company. It's happened to some major banks before, and when those happen, um, it's just important to be, you can, there are things you can do to fix them, but you have to be aware of, of the fact that they can occur before you can do that. And, and Eric, those, <clears throat> those can be for a number of reasons. One might be to actually bring your system down uh, because there's some dispute uh, with the particular organization. But another could be uh, for extortion purposes. So the site comes down, it's where you primarily operate, at least online, and uh, you know your members can't access the site. It's very uh, important to your organization. Um, and, and they'll come back to you and say, look, uh, you know, we'll, we can bring this back up and we'll lay off, but here's what you're going to need to do. Transfer money here, whatever it is they, they're demanding. So a number of different, different reasons why those DDoS attacks might come into play. And that's not necessarily, uh, again, that's not grabbing data and taking data away, but we, we look at that in the world of cybersecurity because it's an exposure uh, for your organization. Absolutely. All right, we ready for the next uh, we are. slide? Okay. Hit the button. You know, on those, one other point on those malware emails, um, they, if, if you've not seen these, just be aware of how professional some of these and how real some of these emails look. Sometimes it's easier to spot the ones that are, that are kind of sent out on a mass basis and, they, and the bad guys realize only a very small percentage of, of millions and millions of emails will be clicked on, but it's, it's really no, uh, you know, it's, it's not that big of a deal to them because they send it all out uh, en masse. But, uh, I've seen some that look like they're from Federal Express, from USPS. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, they're, they're really, they're really, they can be, it's very deceptive. They look very official. So you also have to kind of take a breath and slow down when you see something and just think about the email. It'll say, hey, you know, if you want to, we've got the tracking for your package that's being delivered to you. Well, are you expecting a package? If you are, then maybe it's legitimate. The other thing you can do is if you ever have concerns, you can actually call the organization that is supposedly sending you the email. I know all this takes time, but if you have suspicions and you deal with a lot of um, you know, data in, at Venable here, it's an issue I try to be very careful about, emails coming in, because we get a lot of email that's unsolicited. And um, we're very fortunate we have a great tech team that helps us with all that stuff. Uh, but I'll see those emails. They say they're from Federal Express. They say they're from uh, UPS um, or from the Postal Service, whatever it is, um, trying to get you to click on a link. They'll say click here and, and you can find the tracking information. If you do that and it's not from a legitimate source, you could very well be downloading malware that, for example, then allows the bad guys to capture your keystrokes. So you're going in, you're typing in the name of the website where you go to bank, they're catching that, then you're typing in your keystrokes on your password. Now they have your, your password. Um, one thing you can look at, just as a technical tip that's helpful, 
when you see an email and if the spelling is all correct, obviously if the spelling's wrong and you don't recognize uh, things in the email, then you need to stay away from it. But even if it looks legitimate, you can look at the from address and then you can also scroll your a mouse, you know, your cursor up, take your mouse and scroll your cursor up over the, the from address or the link. Uh, this is particularly helpful if there's a link in there that says, yeah, this is UPS, click on this link. If you scroll that link down in the bottom of your window, you may be able to see the actual domain address associated with that link. And I've done that before when it looked legitimate, and you can see it ends in .ru, for example. So that's something coming from Russia, and that doesn't add up. I'm going to just add a quick point to that, because I think it's really useful that you can actually just take away with you right now. If you receive an email that asks you to, from a company that you're doing business with that asks you to click on something, or they're asking you to provide information related to either your credit card number or your Social Security number, you should be very cautious about that because companies do not ask you to do that on a regular basis. That's, that's beyond what they do. What, they, what they'll typically do is provide you a notification of something and maybe ask you to call them. And then even if you call that number and it says, oh, this is Bank of America, and, and they ask you for your Social Security number or your credit card number, you might be involved in something. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, that is, we're, we're probably all ruined who work in this space because even if I get a legitimate email from my bank and they say you need to call us, I don't call the number they give me in the email. I look up in my contacts, what's my number I use for that bank? Then I'll call the bank and say, look, I got an email that says this, can you get me to the right place? Because the bad guys want you to call them instead. But you can't use that excuse with your spouse. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. I wasn't sure it was you, honey. Okay. So we've talked about, okay. so we've talked about uh, at a high level, what are the bad guys after? We've talked about at a high level, who are the bad guys? And we've talked about how do they do, at a high level, how do they do what they do? So that gives us this broad perspective of kind of the, the, the activities that are out there, the potential exposure points. Now let's talk briefly about some of the potential harms is how I like to phrase it. Um, but there are no, it's really important for us as we look to address these things, it's good for us to have an idea of really what, am I, what is my exposure? What could really happen uh, if I have an incident and I'm not uh, prepared for it? So just look at this list here. I won't read them all off to you, but you know, think about, and, and some of this uh, has to be, um, it, it depends on your particular organization, and some of this may be more relevant for you than for other organizations. But it, as you see that list there, and this is just the first page, uh, quite a few things that can come in in the way of what you lose that has value to you as an organization. So there are things you lose that have value. Pretty uh, important list there. There's also a list that follows of the cost. So these are the actual things that are going to cost you money um, in having to deal with it. You can see legal counsel and forensic um, uh, costs there could be uh, involved depending on the nature of the breach. Eric, this next uh, slide, you if you want to jump. Yeah, on I'll, go that. Through, I'll go through this quickly. Um, it, there, there are a number of potential harms, and I, I won't go through each of these, but. If you can, you can just see them. Um, the, the basic point is a, a breach is going to cost an organization uh, or a, a nonprofit a lot of money, and it, it's going to cost a lot of money for a lot of different reasons. This was something I saw when I was working in the Illinois AG's office when I saw companies responding to the breaches that they were, or organizations, frankly, or nonprofits when they were dealing with breaches, um, what they were having to go through to do it. There are just to give you a, a, sort of an overview, there are 47 different state laws on data breach notification, all of which have different requirements. And just, the, just responding to that is a massive undertaking for or an organization. Even if, if it's, even if it's a, just a 15,000 in individuals or if it's 5 million. Um, and so uh, the, the main takeaway should be, yes, this would be a, a very expensive and we want to try to prevent this as much as possible. But if, if we want to, if you have anybody has, has any questions about any of the individual costs we list, we can talk about that, but you can probably get a good sense for it. And remember the, the cost in particular, the contractual liability piece, that's again something that uh, people can tend to overlook. It's where you have those commitments to other parties whose information you have, uh, or maybe it's uh, to your members' commitments you've made. And if you have an incident that would cause you to be in breach of those agreements, that's another area of exposure for the organization. Hi, maybe you could talk very quick, quickly on what you classify as a breach because there are always viruses, malware, you know, that are being downloaded to PC. So what's the threshold for considering something to be a breach? Oh, that's, a, that's a really great question. Um, 
But I guess you can refer to it in a couple, a couple ways, but when, when I think of a breach, what, what I'm thinking of is a breach of personally identifiable information that results in a legal obligation to notify uh, those customers that are affected. That's, that's one aspect of it. And when that occurs, you, you, that's when you're looking at uh, all the notification costs across the country. Uh, you're looking at all of the, the issues related to um, yeah, sort of bad, bad publicity, the way that can harm your organization. And so when you, when you hear about, quote, unquote, a data breach, that's, it's typically in context of something where a, a loss of information triggered a notification requirement. But I should add as a caveat, both the Congress and the states are continuously looking at what, sorts, what types of information should lead to a, a notification requirement, and that is always expanding. And it will, I, think, I think it's, it's fair to say that that will continue to expand as more and more data is collected. For instance, it used to just be Social Security numbers and credit card numbers. Now it's email addresses and passwords, and some states have now added biometric information. Uh, so that's one aspect of it. And then the other point I just want to make quickly is a breach that could harm your organization can be beyond personally identifiable information. So I don't want to make, limit it to that. I mean, you could have a, a breach of data that's related to um, maybe you know, confidential you know, information that's important to the nonprofit uh, that's stolen that could be very damaging to the nonprofit or an organization, but at the same time doesn't require you to go out and notify individuals or even notify the government that it happened. And so a, a breach broadly is just a when, in, when an unauthorized third party obtains confidential information through your system. But when you hear that terminology used publicly, often it's a referral to a, sort of a legal requirement to notify um, both individuals who are affected and the government, if that answers your question. Okay. And one thing, one thing I, would, I would do is as you, because things can be particular to your particular organization, you know, how you address risk, what are your risks, what is the data that is, uh, that is significant. I would encourage you to start at a high level and say, um, it goes along with what, what Eric is saying, I would start at a high level and say, look, any unauthorized activity uh, affecting my systems where there could be a, an, an unauthorized access to or disclosure of or acquisition of data, that would be my starting point of saying, okay, that's kind of a broad look at what is an incident. And then let me drill down based on my own organization and what my, uh, you know, what my risk profile is and my exposure areas are. And then you may need to refine that definition. But at a high level, I would, I would think about it like that as you, as you consider how best to protect your organization. Does that make sense? Eric, uh, yeah, thumbs up. Eric and Bobby, we did have a question from the webinar asking if there's a uh, kind of a free publicly available resource out there online where, where folks can um, – kind of get a listing of those 47 uh, state laws on, on uh, data breach n notification requirements. Is there anything like that that any of you guys are aware of? Yeah, there's a, there's a, a lot of them. If you literally, you know, do a search, I'm not going to say Google it because I don't, I don't, you know, there's lots of other search engines, but if you do a search for them, you'll see some. There are law firms that have posted them up there. If you're an attorney and you're a member of the Association for Corporate Counsel, uh, Association of Corporate Counsel, ACC, they have resources. And also keep in mind that if you have, we're going to talk about cyber insurance later, but if you have cyber insurance, your cyber insurance carrier and the breach council that they will help you connect with will largely handle that for you or at least help you address that issue so you're not panicked and sitting there looking at 47 different state laws. But there are literally charts out there that you can, you can find pretty easily. And if you can't, you can contact me and I'll send you a couple that I have in my, my, uh, stored on my computer somewhere that I hope is very secure. <laughs> yeah, and I should also mention as you as you look at those, uh, you should see it, there are 47 states currently, and then there are also it's the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, Guam, and Virgin Islands have something. So don't uh, don't miss those if those are relevant to your organization. I think we're ready. Are you we're ready for forward? the next slide? Yeah. Okay. okay. We'll move us forward. Could I, could I also suggest there, someone asked a question at one point, not today, but I've had it before about, about uh, insurance, and there's a lot of confusion in the insurance world, and I can appreciate that. Um, we'll talk about insurance in a little bit, but just one thing I want to mention is this list of potential harms, that might be a helpful list for you to take with you when you're talking to your broker, just to kind of help guide the conversation and say, look, here are the things that I'm wondering if I should be worried about, and if so, what 
can you tell me about the particular policy that you're presenting to me right now on cyber uh, insurance? How does it address these various exposure areas? I think that could be a good, um, a helpful guide as you move forward. Okay, the next one's me. Okay, so now we're going to shift into, now that we've kind of probably scared some folks with how broad this is and how much harm, potential harm there is, but it's a great way to jump into now, what can I do to address some of this? You'll see what we've done is we've broken this out into different buckets. And the, the way I like to think about it is there's a bucket of things that you can do that help prevent. They actually help prevent a problem from occurring. I notice that I say they help prevent. They don't uh, guarantee that it will be prevented. I'm not aware of anything that does that, but they will help. There's another bucket of things that you can do that they don't help prevent the, the incident, but what they do is they set you up in advance to help mitigate the harm, to minimize that harm that will result uh, from an incident. And then there's the third bucket, which is a more commonly, I think, thought of bucket, which is what do I do when I, when I have a breach? There are things that you should be thinking about there as well that help uh, minimize the impact of that uh, particular breach. So with that, let me just um, talk to you a little bit about what we're seeing here. These are some of, of our suggestions for things that you think about and work through as you try to address uh, the, the risk related to cybersecurity for your organization. Having somebody that's, that's in charge um, is, is an important point. Um, I know, Dan, this is something that, that you brought up, and, and you may have specific experience on why that's so important. It is. I mean, it, it sounds like the simplest thing, but it's probably one of the first things that um, – um, if you're if you have an incident, if you have a breach, and regulators are interested, or plaintiffs counsel is coming at you, that's one of the first things they're going to ask. As former plaintiffs counsel, that's one thing I would have asked in any <laughs> compliance program. Who's in charge of it? And what were they doing? Uh, but uh, even more important than that, it's just somebody needs to be responsible for it, and you need to communicate that out to say this person is in charge of our privacy and security programs. Everyone knows where to go to ask those questions, even in a small organization. It needs to be a part of their formal part of their performance objectives or whatever you have. Um, to measure someone's success um, and determine their compensation or their, their bonuses or whatever it is. You want that to be a key part of their job, so they're incentivized to do that because <laughs> otherwise nobody really wants to be responsible for it. Um, and it doesn't have to be someone in IT. It doesn't have to be someone in legal. It, it, you know, it can be from any department. You don't have to have an IT background to do it. There are ways to get help, and I'll talk about those more. I, don't, I, don't, I have no technology background. Uh, I had a flip phone until two years ago, so uh, <laughs> that gives you some perspective on how paranoid and on, on, you know, lack of technology savvy that I have. Um, so uh, we can, we'll talk about that more later, but definitely putting some, just designating someone in charge, you don't even need to give them a formal title, but putting them in charge of that is really the first step and probably the most important step to getting a lot of this stuff implemented. If it makes you feel any better, Dan, I, I believe it was Warren Buffett. I read about a year or so ago. He had a flip phone as yeah. well. Still has it, yeah. at least as of yeah. when that article. Probably a nicer one than I had. Yeah. But. <laughs> My wife was pleased to, to hear about that because she didn't feel as badly. We, we went in to, to get a, an iPhone for one of the kids, and she pulled out her flip phone in the, uh, in the Best Buy store. You should have seen the look on this kid's face. He, he goes like this. He goes, whoa, what is that? <laughs> he thought maybe she'd taken it from a museum or something. Uh, she has since upgraded. All right, if you look at the, um, if you look at the, uh, the second bullet there, I just want to point out one thing that I have also seen kind of create the light bulb moment for some folks. So if it's helpful to you, I just want to point it out. Consider as you are going through these assessments, um, you know, you, typically you hire an outside consultant who can help with the assessment. Consider and talk with your uh, lawyer, your outside lawyer, about the possibility of having your lawyer actually retain that uh, expert. That, just, that can help protect the attorney-client privilege. Uh, if you think about it, if a lawyer is hired to provide legal advice to the organization, anything that is information that is shared for the purpose of providing that legal advice, including if I go and get help from a security consultant to help me advise the organization about legal matters, that's, that's information that should be protected by the attorney-client privilege. So it's just an important point to keep in mind. Have that discussion with your attorney. That uh, may not be necessary in every case. It may not be practical in every case. And, let me, let me and, and Bobby, just to be clear, so everyone knows the significance of that, the, the idea behind it being that 
if you later get challenged in you know, a governmental investigation uh, from a, a private uh, lawsuit uh, saying that you were negligent in, in your security practices, uh, all of those steps that you took with the security consultant, all of those discussions, documentation would all be protected by the attorney-client privilege and not subject to discovery yeah. uh, by those folks. And that's, and, a, and that's a great point. And let me, let me add to that point, too. Just having been on the government side doing these investigations, I can guarantee you that if there is a breach that your organization suffers, they will ask for the information and they will try to obtain any sort of assessment that your organization or nonprofit undertook. And so it's very important to remember keep in mind that someone will be asking for it at some point and that you want to keep it in a you want to keep it under the individuals at your um, organization who are the lawyers or your outside counsel who help direct it because you are doing it to prevent negligence uh, to you are doing it to protect your system and so it, it does make sense for an attorney to be involved and and we'll talk about this as it relates to that third bucket of information or act, the third bucket of activity around what do I do when I have a breach, but the same concept applies here. Um, and Jeff, I appreciate you diving deeper into that. That's great. I sometimes take for granted some of the lingo we toss around, but yeah, attorney-client privilege is an important point here. Um, if you think, especially if you were going through your very first assessment, you really don't know what it's going to look like when you you know get under the covers there and see what's happening. Um, it's it, it, the, the, uh, a report coming to your outside lawyer on, in the first instance is a much better, in the end, and I realize this is in a perfect legal vacuum which, in which we don't really operate, but where it's, where it's practical to do so and you can have your outside lawyer actually retain that consultant. Imagine the, the flow of work. The, the consultant does the work, does the digging around in the system, then comes back and talks to the lawyer and issues a report to the lawyer. Well, that report might contain some really nasty stuff. But so far, it hasn't been shared with the organization, and at least at that point, we should be able to have some protection on the attorney-client privilege around that. So it just gives us more control over the ability to prevent harmful, potentially harmful things from coming out later if there's an issue and you're challenged, as Jeff was talking about. Isn't there a downside to, uh, to doing that in that if you need to prove the reasonableness of your evaluation, your your searches, your um, preemptive uh, work, uh, and you you cannot be selective about what you waive. And so, you know, wouldn't it be better to pick and choose what you have outside counsel or in-house counsel um, retain on a privileged basis, so that you don't waive the entire privileged relationship with the consultant? Yeah, it's a it's a great it's a great point for a distinction between these types of things we're talking about and then that third bucket that we're going to get to where you've had a problem. Where you've had a problem, I would say, in almost every situation where it makes sense for your organization from a cost standpoint, uh, it, it, it would be something I would, I would like to see the organization do, and that is have the lawyer actually retain the, the expert. When it comes to these assessments where you're trying to show you've been diligent, the reason why I say it may not be practical is you really do have to, I realize things have to be done based on what you can afford to do and prioritizing within the organization. But where you can do it, you, could, you can re have that initial review done by the outside attorney, can have some discussions with the internal team around giving, providing the legal advice, and then to the extent you need the assessment to be able to show, you can either have an assessment if there were things that need to be addressed, then that's good. It was addressed. Uh, you've, you've got that out uh, initially. But ultimately, the idea is you would have an actual assessment that is done and delivered to the organization for use for the purposes like you're talking about. And you always have the option of uh, waiving privilege. And, and if it's a helpful report, we do this all the time. Our, our clients have us retain outside experts to do uh, executive compensation studies, uh, to do you know, audits and evaluations of all sorts of, of compliance issues. Uh, and then you always have the option, if you later need to use that comp study to defend yourself in an IRS examination, for instance, you can certainly disclose it. But if the comp study comes out really bad and says you're, you're way overpaying your, your chief executive, then obviously you don't want that to fall in the hands of an IRS auditor. Uh, we did have a question um, about why why does that have to be outside counsel who retains the expert? If the organization has an in-house lawyer, uh, couldn't it be done by the in-house lawyer? 
Yeah, it, it could be done um, internally as well. If it's done properly and the, the inside counsel is taking all those steps to do that. Um, but sometimes it can be, it just depends on what the level of sophistication is and experience for the in-house counsel is to do this. And I should turn this over to Bobby too, because he's going to have experience as having done this. Um, but frequently there are uh, firms, including Venable, that, that know and work with the um, the consultants that can do the actual evaluation themselves. And so there are some economies of scale at play, and it can typically, it can help to, to hire an outside counsel, but you certainly can do it in-house. Okay. Yes, and uh, I think that's a, it's a great point about the experience. That is one reason. Another reason I would add is um, sometimes an in-house lawyer can wear multiple hats, yeah. and issues can arise, at least arguments can arise around well, were you really acting in the attorney role as you gathered that information, um, or were you really more putting on your kind of your, let's say you're an executive in the organization or you're some kind of leader in the organization, you have responsibilities to help the organization operationally. Um, that it can lead to those problems. You're not going to have that same issue with an outside lawyer. So again, I'm talking about where it's the best case scenario where it works for the organization. That would be the preference because you have that kind of, uh, that kind of at least initial protection. And I want to address the, the, your, your question just a little bit further because I thought it was a really good one. If, and, and I thought Bobby, Bobby answered this, but just to add a slight point to it, if, this, if the process is working properly, you're going to have a, an entity come in that's pr and, and under the privilege determine what your vulnerabilities are. And everything that an organization does to protect itself once it learns what those vulnerabilities are should come through in the security program and all the policies and procedures that the, the entity develops. And so you, you, it will come through in just the steps that you are taking to do that. So we're going we're gonna to try to move through this so we can get you all the helpful information. Please note that review contracts with relevant vendors point on there. That's an important one. Yeah, and, Those and are, don't forget, uh, we had a question earlier from the webinar asking about uh, the importance of indemnification provisions uh, in those third-party contracts with vendors. Yeah. Dan, you want to speak to Yeah, that? this is an area where I've had a big, steep learning curve in this position in dealing with vendors. And AARP is a relatively, well, not relatively, we are one of the largest nonprofits. So we have a lot of, we have a full-time chief information security officer. You know, we have a large IT department. We have, I have, when I'm negotiating these contracts, a lot of tools at my disposal that some of you may not. So I want to give some kind of very quick practical tips when negotiating these contracts um, with vendors who may have access to your information. Um, always ask for audit rights, even if you have no intention of auditing their security controls. Um, put some standard in there, ISO 27001, International Stan Organization on Standards. It's a security standard. Um, it's ref I think it's referenced in here. There's PCI, which is the payment card industry. There are all sorts of security standards that are just kind of out there that you can say, you must adhere to these and see what they do. You know, I mean, honestly, that's it. it's, if, if they don't push back at all, as, as Bobby mentioned um, previously, you know, if a, if a vendor just says, oh, yeah, and they'll sign anything, that's not a good sign. Um, <laughs> they're just desperate to get your work, to get your business. Um, have them adhere to some standards. I wouldn't spell out what those should be, like you must have this type of firewall. Refer to some third-party standard. Um, request the right to audit them. One of the best things that I've found is require cyber insurance coverage. Um, because then if you can't do any due diligence, if they have coverage and they send you certificates, that means some insurance underwriter did. Um, and we'll get into the insurance process later, but they do underwrite those policies and it's, the process is incredibly bizarre and it seems to differ every time we do it. But <laughs> someone somewhere at least did some validation of their security protocols, um, otherwise they wouldn't have gotten that insurance certificate. So that's a great easy way to at least get some check on it. Okay. Another, uh, a couple more points on preventing a breach. And indemnification will come up. That's one that falls in the how do I mitigate, what do I, can I do now that will mitigate the harm later? Indemnification falls in that particular category. Um, looking at these last uh, bullet points there, just some final thoughts on how, how you can help prevent. Actually, I'm, I misspoke. It's my last slide on how you prevent. Um, but some of the things we've already talked about there, and it, and it is thinking about those vendors is really the main, one of the main points on this slide. Think about those vendors. And I know, I know there are practical limitations on your leverage and your ability to actually negotiate you know, very uh, robust terms around security, but it's the kind of thing you should be thinking about and having in your discussions with those uh, vendors. So our last slide on 
prevention uh, goes through a f just a few more uh, sort of steps that your organizations can be taking. Um, and I alluded to this earlier, but training employees on security do's and don'ts and doing it regularly is very, very important. It's, that's, that can be an overlooked step, but as I mentioned, uh, employees are, are more often not going to be the weakest part of your uh, defense system, and so they need to understand what they should be doing. And so there are a number of ways you can do that. Um, if you want to be very aggressive, and one, one, you can actually do sort of mock phishing emails and see what kind of – there are companies that will do that, and you can see uh, what the response rate looks like and who ends up clicking on things they shouldn't click. And even those of us who, who think we never click on things, it's a good reminder that any of us can be tricked at any point when you're distracted and you're trying to get through something. And so there are, it's just important to, to make sure you, you focus on the employees. Uh, if, uh, if you want to get more money for your pro security or privacy program, do a little test with your board and executives. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You can hire companies to do these phishing emails, and all of a sudden they realize, oh, actually, it's not, not every phishing email has some reference to a Nigerian prince who needs money. They're actually pretty sophisticated. Uh, and it, it'll, it'll change the conversation like that. I'm not speaking from experience. I'm just saying I've heard from other <laughs> privacy and security professionals that that, in fact, does work. That is a very good point because it does work. People will click on it. Uh, another point that we, we alluded to earlier and have discussed is maintain a written security policy that addresses your document retention and data retention practices, how, safe, how you safeguard uh, information, and how you go about destroying hard drives or physical um, sort of uh, uh, well, what your physical security is and what the, the password um, requirements are. You can – a system can – and your IT people would be able to help you with this, but you can require – a certain number of characters for passwords. There, there are a number of things you can be doing, and it's important that this is all placed in writing, uh, even if you are a small organization or a small nonprofit. And, and it's important for a couple reasons. One, it, it helps you understand internally what it is that you're doing and not doing. But then, two, as we'll get into uh, next uh, when we talk about how to mitigate the liability and the issues related to a data breach, it's very important you can show what you were doing in the event of a data breach, uh, because data breaches happen to everybody, even those that, that have good security practices. And so it's very important to show what those practices are. And then finally, uh, the last point is make sure you maintain top-down emphasis, which means from the board level and executive team, on, the executive team on security. Uh, I can provide a couple examples on that. When I was working uh, in the Senate Commerce Committee, we were spending a lot of time talking about cybersecurity with companies, more on the critical infrastructure side, so these were energy companies and financial institutions, but it's related to nonprofits and organizations because everybody's facing the same, the, um, the same problems and challenges. There was a, we, we, we did an investigation and we asked questions to find out why there, we had these issues with cybersecurity. And what we found is there was often a disconnect between those who were in the C-suite or those who were on an executive team, which applies to nonprofits, and those who were doing the IT work. And so we would hear from the, the head of IT, oh, we're in, we have all these issues, we're fighting for budget, we really are concerned about our vulnerabilities, and then we would you'd talk to a CEO or, or um, a leader organization, they would say, oh, yes, our cybersecurity or our data security is fantastic, and we have exactly what we need. And so until you have buy-in from the decision makers on data security, you're, you're going to be left with vulnerabilities because the proper amount of um, – the, the budget's not going to be there to prevent um, uh, incidents from occurring. And when it, it's in, in, I know everyone always says this, but I've seen it happen on being part of these investigations on both the private sector side and doing the investigations on the government side. It is so much more expensive to try to respond to a data breach on the back end and fix your data security there than it is to do it ahead of time. And so uh, the more information that can be provided to um, the boards and executives about that, the, the better off you're going to be. Go ahead, did you have something to add? Yeah, I wanted to drill down a little bit from, from the in-house perspective, from having been in the position to try and get a handle on some of these things, because it is, it is no offense to you, you know, law firm lawyers, but it's very easy to just tell your clients, oh, all you got to do is just draft a bunch of policies about uh, destruction of data. Well, that's okay, destroy data. It's, it's really hard uh, to actually do that. And so I think having been sitting in, these, in the other side of the, of the stable in, in many of these seminars and people are telling me to, first thing you got to do is find all your data. You got to know where it is. You got to do a data inventory. And you're like, well, how the heck do I do that? Um, it's not easy. We just did it. 
Um, and uh, it takes a long time and it's a lot of work. And we're big, so it's much harder for us. But there are some key things that you can do, even if you don't have a technology background. You know, you don't need to be a technologist to be able to establish disciplinary standards for violating your security practices. One of my colleagues used to work at a huge uh, technology company um, in their security practice, and he recalled a meeting once when they were with their CEO, and the CEO said, how many people got fired last year for violating our security practices? And they were like, oh, none. And he's like, out of 100,000 employees or whatever. And they're like, yeah, none of them got fired. And the year before, it had been like 10. That was one of their metrics uh, that they were measured on. And he threatened to fire the entire department because he thought they weren't catching people. When in reality, they had just son done such a good job of scaring you know, the crap out of everybody there and enforcing these things that no one had actually, been, actually violated them. So those are things that you can do as a non-technologist. Um, Data collection, the thing, and when we talk about um, destroying data, if you look at the OPM breach, you know, why did they have 40 million people's information in there? I mean, it, was any, did they really need all of that? You know, one of the key ways you can really you know, prevent, a, not only prevent a breach, but this is probably more about mitigating it, is just not collecting information you don't need, like social security number, right. um, not storing it for longer than you need it. Your fundraising people will be like, oh, we have to have every donor that has ever donated to this organization and black bought for a thousand years. It's permanent. You never know when that person, oh, they dead? They could be reincarnated. We don't know how this freezing of people, and they come back and they want to donate and we don't know how to reach them? We just left $25 on the table and that's coming out of your salary. So every fundraising department, every nonprofit is the same. I know, I've worked with lots of them. So, but no, you don't need to store that. <laughs> you can get rid of that. And you have to find the right balance, and there are lots of vendors and law firms who can help you do that. But just even thinking about, do we need to keep everything all the time? So if we do have an incident, maybe it affects 5,000 people instead of 25,000 people. Also, it will dramatically lower your insurance costs and make it more likely you'll get coverage um, or get good coverage if you can say we have 20,000 people instead of 100,000 people in our database. Um, so those are some of the things that you can, you don't need any technology background to even start looking at those things. And Eric, I presume that all the things on this slide, obviously they're all designed to help prevent a breach from occurring, uh, also designed to help uh, mitigate the damage if there is one. Uh, but it's also, from the lawyer's perspective, doing all these things helps establish that you were not negligent in your security practices, in your data privacy practices, and therefore if you later get challenged by a governmental investigator in a private litigation yeah. or somewhere else, uh, you're able to say, no, look, we did everything that a reasonably situated, you know, similarly situated reasonable organization would have done, but the bad guys got through anyway, but we shouldn't be held liable or responsible for that. No, that's absolutely right. I think that's a good segue to our next slide because all of this is related. What you, what you are doing to try to prevent a breach can also help you mitigate the harm that a breach um, can cause you on the liability side. And when, when a, uh, either there's a private litigant or you're, and you're part of a class action or a regulator um, at the state or federal level is looking into your company's practices or, I mean, sorry, your organization or your nonprofit's practices following a breach, and, and I'm going to general, generalize a little bit, but I think it helps for this discussion. Entities end up falling into two categories. Um, anytime there's a breach, especially at the state level, the state AGs it will, will open up an investigation and they're going to send off letters and they're going to send off subpoenas and they're going to request, request information. And some of these, even though not all these are big breaches either, I want to make that clear. You hear about the ones that are sort of nationwide, but at the state level you have um, entities being investigated all the time, including organizations and nonprofits. And so the, the entities that are, uh, are, are going through this process, you fall into, into one of two categories generally. You either a, it's viewed that you did not take basic steps to protect yourself from some kind of breach that occurred, or it, it quickly becomes apparent that this company suffered, yes, or this entity suffered a breach, but the breach happened in such a manner, um, and the entity, the organization, took enough steps to say that, you know what, we're going to take a step back here and say, these, this, they did what they, they could do, they did their best, and we're going to drop this investigation. And so, and when, when you're in that latter position, you're going to save yourself a lot of time and a lot of money because these investigations 
on, on both the, the regulator side and then also the, private, the class action private sector side can go on for a very long time. It can be very costly. And so the question then becomes, well, how do you go about doing that? How do you, how, how do you go about getting yourself in the, in the, what I call the good category, right, that shows that you were taking the steps that a reasonable comp entity or organization would have been taking in, in that situation? And what this slide goes through a, a couple things that you can use uh, to, to help your organization achieve that sort of what would be termed a sort of reasonable uh, practices, um, data security practices. So first off, review compliance with legal and contractual data security requirements. So what do you mean by that? Well, there are some data security requirements out there that are in law that you just have to be following. And it's, that's a first step. You want to make sure that you're following your uh, legal obligations. The, both the healthcare industry and the financial sector are regulated on data security at the federal level. Uh, the healthcare sector is regulated under HIPAA, and, they, and there are, there's both a law and regulations that are very specific on what um, covered entities under HIPAA have to, have to do. On the financial services side, there's the Graham Leach Bliley Act that requires data security um, standards, and then there's something called the data safeguard rule. If anyone has any specific questions about this, I can go into more detail, but I just want to share that that's out there for you. Um, next is the, if you're dealing with uh, payment card information, is the payment card industry data security standard, which basically are the rules for accepting credit cards and uh, being part of the system. And I, I would imagine that's going to impact um, some of your organizations. If you are failing to meet those standards, and, and what will end up happening is it can, it can be a, a process It's your after a breach occurs, people can start taking a look to see if you are meeting these standards. That can have a huge impact on, on what your liability looks like. And I, I do want to add that um, this, is a, this is developed um, not by the government, but some states have adopted this basically as their standard. So for instance, the state of Nevada now has this PCI, um, this PCI standard in, within their law. And so when they're conducting, if you had a, a, a breach of credit card information that would affect uh, Nevada residents, they're going to be looking to this um, to these standards to determine whether or not your organization's practices were um, uh, proper. And then um, I want to I'm going to jump I'm going to jump to I'm going to come back to third-party contracts, and, but I want to mention something else first. Are the fact that we already discussed the fact that there are 47 data breach notification laws throughout the, the country, along with, as, as Bobby mentioned, which was helpful on the, so the, some of the other the um, uh, territories, et cetera, that, that are relevant because you're going to have um, members uh, who, who may be in those, in those places as well. But there are state laws on data security that could be uh, y it could be expected that you are complying with even if you are not based in that state. If you have um, members who are in that state or, or people who are donating or whatever it would be who are in some fashion associated with your organization or your nonprofit are in those states um, and you are taking information from those individuals, you're going to have to comply with that law. And so there are about a dozen data security requirements currently at the state level. And this all may change because the federal government and Congress has been attempting to preempt the state law, so there's just one national standard, although we all know how Congress is doing generally, and so it's, no, it's not clear when that would actually occur, but it is something they're working on. Um, but I'd just say stay tuned. So in the meantime, it's important to understand what those state laws are. A number of them are just very general requirements that would quote unquote require reasonable data security practices, um, which... Uh, that's a vague requirement, and I'm going to get into in a moment what what you can do to try to, to meet that what that looks like. But then some states, like Massachusetts, for instance, has very prescriptive requirements, which is is a it's a double-edged sword, right? On one hand, it's um, it requires you to take a close look at what they're doing, what they're requiring you to do. But at the, on the other hand, it provides um, a roadmap on what you need to do to make sure that if you uh, that if Massachusetts ever comes knocking on your door following a data breach, you, you do have an opportunity to look at what they're going to be asking you about because I can guarantee you they're going to be asking you about the specific requirements that's in their law. Uh, Eric? Sure. Uh, as most of the participants in today's program uh, work for uh, nonprofits that operate nationwide, is it effectively a lowest common denominator issue where – I mean, if Massachusetts, for instance, has you know the, the strongest uh, prescriptive requirements in this area, that you effectively have to follow them for, for all of your operations. 
Yeah, it's, it, that's a really good question. I mean, it, in some respects, yes. I mean, you, you want to make sure that you're meeting the most, if you're meeting the most stringent requirement at the state level, then you're going to be fine across the board. You know, Massachusetts, it, if there's a, and so if you, and if you were, if you are in Massachusetts, especially, you, you want to be aware of this. Um, for the most part, there's going to be a lot of overlap between what the prescriptive requirements that are in Massachusetts are um, and what a quote-unquote reasonable standard would be anyway. But yes, to be on the safe side, you're absolutely right, um, Jeff. It makes sense to, if you're meeting the most stringent requirements, then you're going to be fine nationwide. And, and what about um, uh, a, lot, a lot of the uh, folks in, in the room and on the webinar today operate internationally. Um, what, what about foreign standards? You know, a lot of folks uh, have, have members, have, have donors, uh, others uh, from, from foreign countries. Uh, do you want to speak to them? I'm going to ask you to go through yeah, an inventory sure. of different... You see, uh, you see my face on that. Um, right, but, so but at a high level... I, I can say, so at a high level, um, and, and this is actually a, a, uh, a issue that's going on right now in, in the, in the data-driven world, and for a very long time, there was a framework between the European Union and the United States on the exchange of data. And that framework um, was, was ruled by a, a court in Europe to be, um, they, it, it's no longer applicable. And so we're actually in, a, in sort of a state of flux right now when it comes to, um, to international data. So what I, what I will say is if, if you are an entity that is obtaining information from uh, European citizens right now, you need to take a close look at that. Um, and and I, ho I hope that's enough, Jeff, for you right now, because it's a, it's, a, it's a moving target literally as we speak. Yeah, that, that's, that's, we've we got to move on. Um, and so I know I'm spending a lot of time on this slide, but I just want to say that I, I would say out of the slides that I'm describing today, I would say this is the most important one, which, I'm spending, which is why I'm spending so much time on it. Because if you're looking at it from the perspective of if a third party uh, comes in and starts asking you questions, this is, these are the issues you need to be really thinking about. Um, next, I want to add uh, third party contracts are very important. You, some states actually require you to, if you are an owner of data, and what I mean by owner of data, if it's data you've collected from individuals in some manner, um, but you have somebody else maintain the data where it's a, an a outside vendor who is putting it on their servers, you still have responsibilities related to that. And some of those responsibilities can be placed in the contract that you have between yourself and that vendor. We've already talked about this a little bit, but it's just very important to, to take a look at the law because some, law, some states do require you to have um, a reasonable data security requirement for that vendor. So if a third party is holding your, your um, the data that you have collected, you need to make sure that that contract states that they're going to be, they're required to take reasonable data security steps to protect that information from unauthorized access. Okay. Um, and so finally, let me move on to, um, I've taught you about the requirements that are out there uh, from, that are coming from the government. Let me just briefly run through the the instances that have been occurring recently where the federal government has actually been, and the state governments have been trying to help companies and nonprofits and organizations and any entity that holds data actually um, improve their data security. So um, I'm going to start with, and what I'll do is when, when, when Jeff sends out the, the email he referenced earlier, there will be links to all these just in case you want to take a closer look because I'm going to do a very quick run through. But if you are going through the process internally in your system of, in your organization of trying to improve your data security, it's, it's, I would say very important that you consult these resources that have been put out by the government because what will end up happening is if you ever get questions from the government uh, about what occurred in a, in a data breach, this is a roadmap to what they're going to be asking you about. Um, I'll first mention the, this is the framework, the NIST framework, this NIST cybersecurity framework, which is a, a voluntary framework for companies and entities that hold critical infrastructure to improve their data security. This is the result of an executive order that President Obama put out a couple years ago. Uh, it's, it's targeted for entities that have critical infrastructure, um, which would, I would guess not touch upon um, your organizations. And what I mean by critical infrastructure are, is literally the electric grid or the, the, the clearinghouse of all the financial data moving through our, our country. And I only mention it because if for, if for entities that are really looking at taking a close look at their uh, cybersecurity, this does provide a roadmap on how to do it. And it, while it is targeted for critical infrastructure um, entities, it can be used and is meant to be used for anyone outside of it as well. So if you really are planning to take a deep dive, this is of some use.
Could you explain what NIST is? Yeah, that's a very good question. Sorry, I, I get caught up in the acronyms of, the, of DC sometimes. So that's the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is an entity within the Department of Commerce. And NIST historically is a, an entity that helps create standards so that our systems can sort of operate together. And they were tasked by the president to help um, lead and convene this effort um, by the private sector to create a, a framework. And by what I mean by framework are just different policies and practices that entities can be taking to improve their cybersecurity. So NIST is a government entity that was helping put together the private sector to help the private sector come together and create the framework. And Eric, we got to move it on. Yeah, sorry. Let me, I'll just mention this other, let me just mention two things quickly. The FTC has done a number of investigations um, related to data security. It's within their um, jurisdiction mandate to do that. They have put out a document on lessons learned, and it basically shows all the things they have brought cases on for data security failures. And so this is a very helpful document. It'll show you why data security failures happen and what the government cares about. And there's also a similar document that the Illinois Attorney General put out as well. And if you're looking at helping, sort of taking a look at your data security, I would really recommend taking a look at these two documents because they're very useful. And I will move on because I know we're running out of time. <laughs> okay. All right. How are we doing, everybody hanging with us? We're almost done. We've got a lot, a lot to cover here in the last 10, 15 minutes. I have a question there. Wait, can you just, can wait for the mic? Uh, just to add to uh, additional resources, U.S. Chamber of Commerce work with NIST and uh, industry to uh, on the framework. So you could also check out the U.S. Chamber of Commerce cybersecurity, but the American National Standards Institute also has a lot of resources relative to standards on cybersecurity. That's right. That's very helpful. All right, great stuff. Here we go. We're gonna we want to cover it all for you because we know it's it's uh, helpful stuff. So let's um, keep your arms and legs inside the ride. Here we go. This um, what I want to point out to you on this slide is that uh, on insurance because we had a question about it. Um, I wanted to um, our previous I've had questions about it. And I know it's important to to folks to try to get a to get a handle on insurance. Just know that there are good things. I can tell you from my experience, there are good things happening in the insurance industry in the sense that what I'm seeing and, and hearing about as being available from a policy standpoint, that is uh, that there are many more options, uh, at least that I'm seeing out there. Um, so that's great news. I think the underwriters are still trying to get a handle on how exactly do we underwrite the risks associated with this. But a couple of things to call out for you to keep in mind. First of all, we talked about that checklist possibly, taking that, the risk, uh, the risk uh, items and, and talking with your broker. I would encourage you to work with a broker who is um, uh, kind of a specializes in this area. They actually have a practice that deals with cyber. It's, it's very different than your typical business insurance. So that's one thing. Um, another thing is I've noticed there can be differences. One of the, one of the differences can be in the sublimits, sub limits and sublimits in your policy. Pay attention to those. Those are very important. The coverage might sound great, but if you look, there's a big limit, and then you have a sublimit. says, yeah, well, for this really cool coverage we just talked about, um, you know, there's only this much money available. And then same thing on deductibles. There are some ver many variations in these policies to pay attention to. Dan, did you have something? Yeah, I just, we just went through this process, so I would echo everything that he said, but also recognize that the cyber insurance shopping process, if you have a very experienced broker, and even throughout the underwriting process, can be a very educational tool for you as well. It's almost you can almost get like a little free risk assessment out of Absolutely. it. Absolutely, um, and important. so you can learn from that process. So I, I think if, even if you don't currently have cyber insurance, for even for you know to start to go through that process and look at obtaining a broker who's um, experienced in that area. Um, you don't want the same broker or the same individual who's handling your other types of insurance dealing with this. They have to have an expertise in this area. Yeah. I like it. And I, I want to mention that other, the last bullet there about game plan. That's what I call the game plan. I didn't actually coin that. I borrowed it from someone else who used it, and I loved it because it's a great way to think about an incident response plan. What is your plan for game day? You want to have that thought through and, and hopefully down in writing so that you have a plan to follow when everything hits the fan because right. that is when, it, when things go crazy, that is not when you want to be sitting around thinking, well, what do we do next and who should I call and what's their number? Right. And Bobby, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to expand on this but just very quickly because this is one of the top things your board or your bosses will ask about. Everyone asks about this. 
what, what is our response plan because you see it everywhere. There are a million examples out there. Pick a couple of them that you like and work off of those and mail them to what you want. Don't buy one off the shelf or if you do or you get someone, make sure you do it and test it. Spend more time testing it really than building it the first time. Get an expert to help you test it. You do not want to be in a situation where, and understand your technology at least well enough to be able to go through that. You don't want to be in a situation where the first time you're asking questions about how your database works or how your systems work is when you actually just had an incident and you're trying to plan for it. It's like watching a game show in Spanish when you only had three years of Spanish in high school. You know something, you know something exciting is happening and you understand every other, maybe every fourth word, but you don't really know what and you really feel like you should and you're missing out on something. Not a good situation if you're in charge of, of that plan. So build it. You can build it pretty quickly. It doesn't have to be complex. It really can, I think ours is four pages tops, and that includes a phone tree. Um, so, but then test it, test it, test it. Yep. The last time uh, Dan was up here on this uh, uh, stage to, to give a presentation to a bunch of animal lawyers, uh, uh, he kept making these analogies. Yeah, the I dating. Care, yeah. I terrible, terrible. Dating. At least you didn't make any dating analogies. No, no, today. I make terrible analogies. That's how I remember stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Those are great points. All right, if you can look at this slide with me, that first one's important. Of course, I don't need to harp on it. But make sure your privacy promises match up with what you're actually doing. In reality, that's very important. When you have a problem down the road, that's one of the questions that will come up. Well, what would you tell people when they gave you the information? How What would you tell them you were going to do about how you'd handle their data? You want to make sure those are consistent. Um, an important point there, the second bullet relates to a question that came up earlier on indemnification. This is under the mitigation category in advance because having that uh, indemnification in your contracts can be very helpful in, in defraying some of the costs. So an example would be if someone's going to be hosting your data and there is an incident where that data is, there's an unauthorized disclosure of that data. You may have obligations, even though that person has the data, their obligation under state law most likely is going to be they have to notify you and then it's good luck. So now it's on you to take the steps that are required to comply with the law. May include notifying people. That could be that could get expensive. That's the kind of thing you can set out in your contract in advance. I realize it has to do with leverage and, and negotiating leverage, but in, but it's something to keep in mind. Who's going to bear that cost? You can build that into the contract. Look, if there's a problem and it happens because of you, then I want you to take care of my expenses related to this. So that's just uh, one one example of how indemnification works. Think think about um, the the it's it's notification obligations. It may be that there is some credit monitoring that needs to be applied. There there may be expenses on your end in the in the way of an investigation you need to do because of the type of uh, breach or incident involved. These kinds of things can be negotiation points and should be in any kind of contract where data is an issue. Okay, Eric, you're up. I will be. So now we're moving on to what should you be doing when, when there is a breach? And this slide, the, the main, the critical point is when, when you, the first two um, bullets go to this, isolate compromised systems and preserve relevant logs and other IT data. And what we're basically saying here is the first thing you need to do, the number one priority is secure the system and determine the scope of the, the breach. You can do that. The best way to do that is hiring an outside firm to do that, a, a, a data security firm and have a, either a law firm or ideally have a law firm that knows what it's doing uh, supervise that so that the attorney-client privilege will apply. Okay, you'll see a point on this next slide. I didn't see it switch. There you go. Work. All right. Notify your insurance carrier. That's important. They're also, in addition to the fact you don't want to have a problem with coverage later, with them saying, well, we didn't know about it, so now we're prejudiced in our ability to cover you. Um, you also can gain some valuable insights from insurance carrier who deals with cyber, and they've seen these. They've had experiences they've dealt with. They can share that, bring it to the table. Uh, and let me interrupt for one second. In the uh, email you'll all get tomorrow with the link to the recording, we're going to also include a link to a webinar we did on privacy and data security about a year ago uh, where one of the panelists was from one of the leading uh, cyber insurance brokers, um, and, and that should be uh, uh, there's a lot of helpful information on the insurance front if you're interested. So here's a little bit more information about what to do when there's a breach and what not to do. Um, I think the most important point from this, and you can go through it later if you'd like, but exercise caution with written communications. And there, there is often a rush to notify when you have 
PII that's part of a breach. And that is, it's important not to get that wrong and then have to redo it. I've seen that happen a number of times when I was on the government side, and it ends up causing more problems for the entity suffering the breach than it was worth in the first place. So when you go, take your time, make sure you're complying with the laws that are in each state, but when you're going public, make sure you've got it right because you're going to save a lot yourself a lot of trouble if you don't have to go back repeatedly and change your story. Quick point, internal communications as well, I would add, or another thing to think about. Just a kind of a caution at the beginning of any kind of uh, breach scenario is let's all just keep in mind that everything that gets written in emails, ultimately if there's a, an investigation or some kind of challenge, those kinds of things could end up becoming exhibits in, uh, in somebody's case. And, and I've seen it where emails will, will somebody thinks it's just an off-the-cuff remark. It's like, oh, I've been, I told people our security was, you know, that's, that's just not the kind of thing you want to have come up uh, when you're trying to explain how you were doing a good job <laughs> managing your... Uh, and that's, and they will, there were regulators who will try to get those, e get those emails. So he's making a very good point. Okay, we're almost there. So you see establishing a command center, it's similar to having a responsible individual. I think it's important to have one place where every, it's kind of a central place. If you have a law department, I, I, would, I think that's a good suggestion, but it, it doesn't have to be a law department, but where everything is coordinated because everyone needs to be on the same page with communications externally, with efforts that are, coming, that are going on behind the scenes in the business. Everyone needs to be on the same page. You may have con uh, notification obligations in your contracts. You may have notification obligations under the law. Obviously, those are important things, and they should be part of your incident response plan, things you want to make sure you can check off the list. Yes, we've looked at that, and we are complying. Did we do it? We did it. We did it with one minute to spare. Uh, <laughs> any burning questions before we wrap up? Uh, hearing none, I want to thank our speakers uh, for a terrific job. Uh, a few folks on the webinar said uh, they very much appreciated the program. I uh, wished it could have been longer. Uh, there's so much information to cover. I think you guys did a great job packing a lot of information into uh, a very short time. And, and, and thanks especially to Dan for joining the panel last minute and providing much needed comic relief as Agreed. well. Agreed. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a happy holidays, and we'll see you back here next year.